They're saying Mitt Romney got hacked. His tax records. He got hacked? <laughs> no, but Mitt Romney's tax records apparently got hacked uh, about 10 miles from where I live. Oh, <laughs> that's bad news, or? That's good news. No, I think it's great news. I don't like him. Okay. <laughs> He's a Republican. I don't like him. Uh, hey, wait, no, welcome. Uh, everybody's uh, is, 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 is over here, and uh, well, I just hand you over the word. Win, welcome. Thank you. Uh, about a year ago, I was doing some stuff for DHS, and they asked me to fill in for Jeff Moss from DEF CON. And they started asking me some questions, and then one thing led to another, and it was this uh, battle between uh, the suits management and the hacker community. And we've all heard of that going on for years. And it got me uh, thinking, and then DHS brought me in this uh, couple of weeks ago to do a uh, presentation on hiring the unhirable. And it pissed a lot of people off, which means I'm saying some of the right things, which is good. Uh, I tested it out originally in Paris, and I did a small one in Holland. I'm doing you guys. So I'm taking this on the road in the hopes to get people to start really thinking uh, that we, if we're going to solve these problems, we need to completely rethink an awful lot of the issues that we've got. Um, are we on the opening slide? How are we doing this? Are we going to just do next? Yeah, next slide. And we're going to pray that we're on the correct slide? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let, let's go to the next one then. Uh, you may know who this is. She's the head of DHS. Yeah. And she says we can't buy, find people. And my answer is no, you can't find people like you. And you need to completely rethink this. Next slide. The Brits say exactly the same thing that they can't find good people. And I just think that's total bullshit. There are plenty of really good people out there, and we have to re-examine how we look at them. Next slide, please. At DEF CON, uh, the director of the NSA gave an award to, I think she was 12 years old, for coming up with a zero day live at DEF CON, which was really, really cool. And then, of course, uh, he, uh, next slide, he gets awkward hugs. I think you guys all know Jason <laughs> Street. Yeah, we know. <laughs> and him and his awkward hugging at things that he does. But the Dernsa was saying things that uh, I don't know how real what he says. He, I think he means it, but I, I'm not so sure we're going to be able to do it uh, with our current thinking. Next slide. What we're really good at, as you all know, is finding ways to say no. No, we can't do things. We cannot do this. It's impossible. Uh, overly cautious issues. Um, they, people don't think with a hacker and engineering mindset. And I often uh, go back to what was the greatest hack in history. Uh, anybody there have an idea of what I would think is the greatest hack in history? Hmm. Shout out. Shout out. Come on, guys. <laughs> In English. <laughs> Fair. Cool. Greatest hack in history, right, I'll tell you. And Remember Apollo 13? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Put the stuff on the table, they say. That's all they've got. Make it work. And to me, that exemplifies what hacking is and thinking differently. So we're really good from a company standpoint of saying, no, we can't do it. Yet, next slot, we are epic fail <clears throat> at an awful lot of things. And these include trying new things, experimentation, the thing that make engineers and hackers what they are. So what I want to do is on the next slide is back to an, something that happened to me. And you should have a picture of a bot. Is that correct? Yeah. All right. I was discriminating. 17 June 1960. Completely discriminated against. I, uh, smart kid, teenager, I wanted to go to work for the best in the United States to do research and <laughs> at the time, Bell Labs. And Bell Labs did some awesome work in those days. 
So I you know, AT and T offices, and I take all the tests. And yes, I can read, and write English. And I'm good at math. And yes, I know calculus. All the stuff. And I say, all right, send me to school. Correct. And I'm gonna help you wire. And then I'm gonna go research it. That's an invent the internet or what? The HR person said, one more test. She brought out this wire and out a pair and said, what color are they? I'm colorblind. <laughs> In that, those days, they, that was discrimination, legal discrimination that they could not have, could not hire me. So, more discrimination because of a myth. Next slide. So, over to the next best company to go to work for in those days. And then, at IBM, you got a job for life, and you get to screw around with great technology, and all oh, this guy. So, and the HR people love me, and they're going to put me through college, and I'm going to do computer shit. That's all great and everything. And at the end of it all, before I signed the, they said, "Oh, what? You got him." They wanted me to look like Ross Perot. <laughs> Cut hair and put on a suit and look like that. It was a form of discrimination. And fast forward slide. We're not all created equal. We're all exceedingly different, and it's more true these days than it ever has been. And we see it a great deal in our communities, of course. And what corporations and what they're doing are trying to get people and find people that have skill fit into their mold of what they consider to be normal. Next slide. That proves up here. Yeah, I keep working on the presentation. Bell curves come in many ways. You have the normal distribute, and then you have a flat curve, which is a low Q, or a very sharp curve, which is a high Q. And we tend to, engineers and geeks, tend to sit on the outside of these curves, not sitting in the north, in the middle. And over the last 50 years, and I'm going to blame corporate America and then all the corporations that have around the world that have taken our model. They're looking for normal, people that they can relate to, that fit into their concepts of what's going to work. The biggest problem finding here, and certainly in the States next night, is as a company, that's some pretty cool stuff over the years, we've done some bad stuff as well, but from an engineering standpoint, we've done some great stuff. Today, people find excuses, Able. And when, sorry, sorry to interrupt you for a second. Uh, yeah. the, um, uh, since you're uh, very uh, enthusiastic, the volume is sometimes slightly high. Why Skype is uh, putting your volume sometimes down? So, um, uh, can you lower your uh, volume slightly? Lower my voice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's mainly because uh, when you uh, when you're very loud, uh, Skype is dropping the amount of uh, volume automatically, and we can't hear you sometimes. Oh, it's normalizing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, no, no, no it's a Skype thing. <laughs> Go ahead. So what? And then we we'll see you. Next slide. Do you have that video working on the next slide? Uh, it should be. But it's not. It, uh, hopefully. No, we don't have internet. Uh, we, no, no, it's a video. Yeah, we, I'm going to put you in IT. Oh, yeah. Because you said on your CV you have a lot of experience with computers. Mm -hmm. uh. <laughs> I did say that's on my CV, yes. <laughs> I have a lot of experience with the whole computer thing, you know, emails. Sending emails, uh, receiving emails, deleting emails. Um, I could go on. <laughs> Do the web. Using mouse, mice, using mice. Um, clicking, double clicking, and, uh, and of course the board. The bit that goes on the floor down there. The hard drive. Correct. Oh. Well, you certainly seem to know your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen management people that are not even as skilled as her. 
And those are the people that we tend to be up against, yet they want IT security problems solved. They want IT problems solved. And stop that and go to the next slide. Sorry. <laughs> One of the first things that we discriminated against here, and I don't know how true it is in every country, but certainly uh, it's true in uh, England and here in the States. If you don't, and that's a form of discrimination. And I'm not in favor of that kind of discrimination because if you have a degree, what does that mean? It means you pass a series of methods, this crap, give it back to us, but don't try to be creative. And I got a real problem with that. Certifications. How many of you have certificates, please? <laughs> like that's a good thing. It's it is that true credential. Is it just one check item? But what you find today often is companies and governments are saying, you don't have one, we can't hire you because you have not passed that test. And again, I'm not a real fan of that because it doesn't show anything about it. Next slide, please. How about some skills? How do we measure skills? And the best ways to measure skills, and I think we've all done it, or where we go, because, okay, we'll take a hacker conference. You sit down, start talking, and if somebody gives you some bullshit, you call them on it. You say, you're full of shit, not that's wrong. <laughs> and learn whether somebody has skills. Very, very We don't do this in the world because you have to have the MBA, you have to have the CISSP. But what does that mean? It doesn't mean a damn thing. Next slide, please. So what they're looking for currently is people that fit in this mold, go through, become security experts through a CS program. But I'll tell you that the thousands of people that I meet around the world have for 30 years now, we don't teach security history. And what does that mean? It means we're making the same mistakes over again. The same stuff we're seeing today is the big one. We're seeing a huge problem. We've been there before. We were there with PCs. We were there with networks. We were there with the script. Bringing it back in. We're bringing it all out. And we're not teaching the history where we've been. We're not fundamentals. And we're not teaching security theory to give people a strong foundation in what stuff is really about. It's not just cyber. There's physical. There's the human aspect, and you have to combine them all and look at security as a holistic issue. We're not teaching that at all. Next slide. This probably is a big deal of what we're going through here in the States. So I great at a government con conference about two weeks ago, and where I gave this presentation, they said, you find out we did that. Nobody's supposed to know. Mm -hmm. Reason, government contractors are supposed to meet certain kinds of standards, MBAs, degrees, CISSPs, and this guy had nothing except skills. And that is part of the problem that we're facing. So what I'm at, what I want to do is next slide. I want to get politically incorrect. I want to shake people upside down and start saying we need to completely rethink the way that we're looking for our experts, the way that we train our experts, the way that we view people. Because in many cases, and you'll towards the end of this, there is a potential, and I talked to some lawyers about this. To make a legal case that geeks are being illegally discriminated against. So let's take a look at how we need to get politically incorrect. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> we not all put it out. And certainly in the States, and tell me over there, helicopter parents. And we tell our kids, Good at everything. You're always a winner. You're going to be wonderful, and everything is going to be perfect. That's bullshit. That's not true. You're real. You're okay, and you suck at this. But that's okay. That's what you 
unhuman that but what makes you you are and i know in the g community we'll sit down and somebody say you can't program it 30, 30 years i forgot entirely how to do it in a language you don't even know <laughs> hey you know how to do something i don't know how to do but we know how to network so we need to get over uh, everybody can do it no. anybody who says in security they can do everything they're either a liar or a fool and you better run in either case so we got to rethink the nature of teaching our kids next slide we need to replace here we learn from failure I'm going to go back to my old career. I was down in Jamaica with Steve Wonder and Bob Marley. I used to be an audio engineer. And we had uh, a concert there with 60, 70,000 people with the government of Jamaica and Bill Cosby and Arthur Ashe. It was a big deal. And we put together, put together the lights. Everything was, the concert is going. And Halfway, this is at night in the middle of Jamaica. <laughs> and I, all, and I, all the light. So we have our emergency light. Oh Christ, there's going to be a riot. What is going on here? And we're using our bolt meter. And somebody, what do we call um, Without, I think I know what it is. And he grabbed a canister of CO2, air extinguisher. Runs over to the transformer by the lighting pole and starts shooting it to cool down because it had overheated. Mm -hmm. He hit. <laughs> but it worked, and we finally got him unarrested. And 20 minutes later, we kept somebody on the pole transformer keeping it cool with a fire in the middle of Jamaica. <laughs> what learned from that? We learned that you can't teach how to prepare for that kind of failure. We can learn from failure. That is where our best lessons come from. I don't necessarily want a guy working for a, my company, and assuming it's a big company, who all knows how to keep my firewall up when it works. When I really, really need his skill, when it fails. What do you do fails? How do you react? Next slide. And we're not teaching this in our school. We're teaching people how to figure everything when it works, not when it fails. Things go wrong, and you can't predict chaotic failure. And we are in a chaotic world because of the nature of our technology. There's too much going on to have any predictability. And we don't teach fundamentally how to deal with unknown failure conditions. Next slide, please. And so I suggest that we start teaching kids very, very early in their lives. How? Let's start when they're two or when they're three. Teach them how to fail. Okay, you just stop in here. What did you learn from that? Let's identify the differences in these kids. Okay, you're really good at this. You're not so And when I was a kid, I remember sitting taking tests at school. And Mr. Mung, the teacher, came up behind me and he tapped my shoulder and I, what's going on? What we did not know then, that I had a form of ADD. And he has some degree of ADD. That's just who we are. That's part of the deal. Inability to focus unless you're really, really interested in it and you hyper-focus in it. And today we can that to be not normal, not part of that bell curve. So we're over here, they're looking for this, but they this over here. How do we make this work? We have to help restructure, please. So I'm suggesting we start in the act of an autism spectrum. And it's not a binary condition. It's not either yes or either. There are degrees of it, just a little bit. And I got a guy who works for one of my companies. I can let him out in public. I can talk to any company. We have one can interface with him because he is so closely autistic, but he also has to come here. So, him into the company and leave him over here. 
We need to start getting companies in our governments to understand that, the, that they need these conditions. This is part. This is part of what you need. Next slide, please. And to start the HR realize that this is part of people that they're going to have or dealing with if we're going to be achieving the proper levels of network defense and cybersecurity that we're really hoping to achieve. We're not going to do it with the same old people that we're trying to fit into these molds. Next, please. Some of the most brilliant people in next. Everybody, who, who there is a fan? Can you repeat your question again, uh, Wynn? Oh, yeah. There is a fan, Nikolai Tesla. Uh, <laughs> was of course. He was fucking crazy. He was autistic. He had Asperger's. He had, he had all of these things. And he had, and he, and he had the OCD with number three. He had, but that is the nature of the kind of things that we have to embrace. So if you go to the next slide, what we're working on right now is, gonna is we're trying to come up with a map between IT security and the kinds of disorders if you will, the not normal, the ADD, the OCD, Asperger's, to try to help find a way to let HR and companies and governments start understanding how to deal with people that are different. I don't think that we're all that different, but they do. So that's part of the, one of the things I've been working on and hopefully will continue to. So next slide. One of the things that I hear from folks, and especially in government, is we can't hire a guy with long hair because we can't trust him. We can't hire somebody because they might be part of an op. How to determine who you can trust? So let's take airport security for a minute. The TSA sucks. <laughs> I mean, has anybody been there through American security where they take off your prosthesis, remove your hair? It's a pain. Everybody is a criminal. But in Europe, and I travel around the world a lot, what they do is what we profile. You guys, you guys profile. Profiling is the nature of what we do as security. Next slide. Now, I don't know if you guys have this TV show over there. Uh, it's about uh, a guy who does complete profiling and examining uh, whether you're lying or not. And ultimately, when we talk about profiling, or I talk about profiling with regards to security, I don't care your religion. I don't care your color. I don't care anything other than are you being deceptive. Are you trying to lie to me? That's the only trigger. When you do European and other and Asian airport security, and they do that interview, they're looking for one thing, deception. That's it. And they can do it through the mic muscles around the eyes, around the, to the mouth, and the show is called Life. And if you have, have, don't have an, if you have an opportunity, you guys have a torrent, right? <laughs> yeah, we have. <laughs> it's a great e-show, and if you don't like the show, fair enough, but take a look at how this guy profiles people very, very quickly, and how we can apply it in HR, and you can do a profile for under in under a half to determine if somebody's betting test from a security standpoint. Next, so we have to begin proof, and here in the U.S., that is considered uh, absolutely bad. It's absolutely horrible. Yet, it's going. It's the only thing that's going to work, in my opinion. Next slide. The other thing we don't do is revetting. These two guys here. James, CIA, guy in the right, uh, and Robert Hansen, CIA, FBI, top counterintelligence guys against the Soviet Union, both work Soviet Union, for 20 years inside of two of our top security agencies because of pure epic fail stupidity. We don't go back, read that them looking for deception. They do it in a binary function, going through pain. 
oh, it looks good here, check it off. And that is not the security, the human level at all. And none of this would accept it at the, uh, at the tech level either. Now, this, so the issue of trust with the next slide, we need to redefine what we mean by clearances. And this really annoyed people at the DHS conference of the military last couple weeks. Because we're using a clearance system based upon the Cold War mindset that it's all or nothing. If you have that you're cleared for secret, you can have all this secret shit. But you really only need this little tiny bit of it to be able to do some network defense. You know, you don't have the crap. So we need to redefine what we're talking about when it comes to uh, the nature of clearances as from your defense. That's one set of criteria. You're doing CNA, computer app, that may be another set of criteria that's going to have a different level of vet, a different level level of deception, and perhaps a different level of clearance. That doesn't mean you have to know where the aliens are back. It just means I need to know how this code works in this particular case. Next slide. Well, I was at a meeting at that, and I was with a defense contractor and a buddy of mine, and they were trying to do a deal. And he goes, anything, any reason I can't hire you? He goes, yeah. So we can't hire Canadians to do computer network defense in the United States because Canadians are a national security threat to America. <laughs> we need to rethink the, as to what we really mean. We can bring in Indians, we can bring in Chinese, we can do all of these things, but we can't bring a Canadian in to help with the government? <laughs> Come on with this, I'm sorry. <laughs> Next slide. This affects me more than you guys, but I've seen it all over the place. Those of us who are older than 39 years old, and I'll just leave it at that, some great people out there can make jobs. And what I'm seeing, I don't know if you're seeing it over there, is a lot of the top security that have spent 20, 30 years are being pushed aside to get the new kids that are coming to college because they're a lot cheaper and they don't know shit. <laughs> That's, so we need to really start rethinking that. There, okay, I've got a, it says, I'm looking for a picture of an 80 year old security guard at my local liquor store on weekends. They got a security guard, and so help I just got that he, he is older dirt. And I, he can't defend the gaming. Two guys come in. So we need to really redefine where the value is. The kind of, we use the concept of emeritus. You've got 30, 40 years experience. Oh, not going to work full time, but you have insight. How can we use that insight? And thankfully, with folks like Howard Schmidt, Don Parker, Dorothy Denning, folks like that, they're not being completely tossed aside because they're independent of the gun process, forced retirements, and the same thing in corporations where they're trying to bust. Outside of that, we're in better shape. But inside the defense, we're kicking out the folks. Uh, let's go on to the, uh, the next one where it says, saying no to great geeks. Uh, it should, there should be a picture of a link there. Is that correct? We have the same slide? Yes, we are. Yeah. Okay. A um, couple front line. Um, some of the best animation testers, and you might even know who these guys are, but I can't use their names. They cannot go to work in a lot of these places, top corporations and the government, because they have a bad credit history. What? National security threat, doesn't it? Credit scores too. So we're losing great peaks because of these stupid, antiquated reasons. Next slide, please. Everybody knows that everybody can come in at 9 o'clock, turn on, become creative, and then turn off creativity at 5 o'clock, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, we need to get companies and government, we got to get over this. Sometimes you. We wake up, I need to wake up at 2 in the morning, and I'll tell my wife, I got an idea, she goes, what is that? 
well, I'm gonna go down the stairs. How long are you gonna be? I said, I'm 10 minutes. She says, I'll see you tomorrow. Wait, maybe maybe it's a good question. Um, who doesn't have a natural um, clock in itself by working um, in the evening or nights or just at the moment you like? <laughs> well, That's everyone. I, I, about seventy-five percent. I try to have a clock, <laughs> but when, when that when, when you get that, oh, I got we are compelled to do it. And that means, okay, I'm going to go to work for 40 straight hours and you won't see me for days. Get used to it, people. Learn how to deal with it. And this is a major problem corporations, HR, the lawyers, and all this other. The next what How are we testing for drugs? <laughs> We <laughs> <laughs> allow raging alcoholics to run our intelligence. We allow them to run our government, to go blue, running Washington Basin with hookers, have DUIs. Yet, somebody who smokes a little completely unqualified work on a network. And smoke reminds me here, uh, is better than us. But it, you know, it typically, it's not the greatest in the world. Um, my son had PhD, and because we live in a state, uh, Tennessee, they have tried the methamphetamine. <laughs> but marijuana does the same thing without all the bad side effects. Yet, we can't do that because it's illegal. So all these crazy things. So we allow the raging alcoholics, but it else is potentially bad. So we stop this drug testing crap. Don't ask, don't. And with the gaze of the military, we need to start doing here. And if things start really influencing or getting in the way of work, whether it's booze, crackhead, it gets in the way you know, it has to be dealt with. But this also gets back to the issue of the raging alcoholic has a disease. So we treat him as a main problem. We treat drugs as a crimp problem. Yet, how do we know don't take some soft drugs from time to time? So I'm not ready hands there unless you're going to say, well, you're a pilot, you don't give a shit. <laughs> Uh, you, you know our drugs policy uh, over here, uh, Win. Yes, it's changing on January first, twenty thirteen. I know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you're moving to the Netherlands, or? <laughs> I, I I know absolutely nothing. It's um, I, I think from you, I think it's a stupid thing to get to Amsterdam. You got the chief of police. You got everybody. It's against. It's just push it all back to the streets where it all, over to the areas where you don't want it anyway. <laughs> but get over it. Yes, yeah, so it's a little drunk. Hello? How many pot fights has anybody ever been in in Amsterdam? <laughs> <laughs> all right, sorry, Mom. That's politics. I don't do politics. <laughs> so um, let's go to the next slide. No. And I don't need the drugs here. My son. A couple of his friends got recruited by the NSA, and this was four or five years ago. Really smart kids, and so they got partial scholarships and work study stuff, and they're going to progress through the whole thing and become something with the government. About a year and a half, two years into it, they all quit the program. Why? Because they, because they're smart. Research and they discovered a tool called Google. <laughs> the research and realized what they have to turn into and what they would have to change about themselves to fit into this world that they did not want to be. So, really smart kid gone out of the program, and the this is happening all over the United States, and yet. 
our experts and our government are saying we can't find the experts. And I have a major problem with that. Now, where do people that are talented go to work? Well, there's a lot of fishing out there these days. All right, we have the NSA, we have the Pentagon, we got all these great companies that have some cool technology that need help. But they're not going to hire the kind of people that I'm suggesting to hire that we all know have the kinds of skills. Where do they go to work? Next slide, please. Organized crime. Very well. And they don't care about your dreams. They don't care what you look like. They don't care about anything other than deliver the code. Maybe other than the U.S. You know, don't care. <laughs> For us. Next slide, please. <laughs> so we are feeding our own enemies with the very skill set we should be hot out of fear and incompetence at the managerial, corporate, and governmental level. Next slide, please. So, to get them to come to work for us, what do we need to give? Well, when they could become criminals, they're not PC. I guys are politically correct, but I know when I'm at DEF CON, I don't have to be politically correct, and I DHS get because I don't have to politically correct. I get to say what I think. Then again, I don't have to show up in an office with a suit and a tie and be nice to bosses that are complete blithering. So what can we give them? Now, let them go to hack. Where are the skills? Where do you meet people? Where do you learn stuff? Let's them the budgets to go to the places where they know that they're actually going to be able to get some additional knowledge so mission critical in us to get our done. Next slide. You as I don't know your laws. Let's say I'm working for a big company and I'm designing something. Oh, you own that product. I get it. I understand that. But then 49 hours straight through and somehow, what? My job would be a lot easier if I built a little tool to automate one little process and it could save me a time. And we've all done that. In the U.S. That's cool. Yeah. And I let the guy who invented the damn tool own his own tool. It is not company property. The big project is the company. Intellectual property. The little tools, let them own them. Next slide, please. We need port systems to Except the people we need. We give them to the physically handicapped. We give them to alcohol abusers. We give them to everybody, except we do not have support systems that may not fit into the normal social systems. We have to completely redefine that how HR and the support system we have to include some of the features that the people that we need to make this stuff work. Thanks, Swap. How about this? <laughs> we, meetings, uh, in, in my mind, a meeting is what you guys are doing over there right now. Somebody comes up with an idea, and, and we buzz together, we travel, but then they all come back together again. You know? It's a dynamic, lip process. It is not death by PowerPoint. And that is, fortunately, the way that uh, we do too many of these things. Then let's give these guys. Give us some access to some really cool technology. Let them screw around with it periodically. Why not? Visualization technology. We can do an awful lot of stuff. People want to hurt technology. They want to find out how cool it can be and what we can do with it that is not. That's why Jaguar and That's why there's some cool stuff that are actually coming out of national labs here. We need to give them that technology and next slide, allow them to be able to do something because unless if we're going to defend these systems, you got hacker as well, and you need those kind of environments given to you. And in the corporations and government stuff that I've seen in the last couple of years, 
it's all defend, 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 but how do you defend if you don't know the attack is, when you're not giving me the attack platform, an attack platform, how can I predict what's going to, and the endless cycle now, the current technology reigns. Next slide. And this was targeting uh, more of the big companies as to, what, do you, what should you, somebody gets hired who doesn't fit? Um, this is going to be, well, and they're going to tell you exactly what you think. If they think you're an idiot, they're going to tell you, you're an idiot. That's wrong. They're going to want to be combative. That's the nature of geeks, is to com be combative intellectually. Teach me something. I'm wrong. Oh, shit, I was wrong. You're right. Thank you. And we go back and forth, and that doesn't fit into uh, the uh, organizations that are trying to uh, hire people right now. Now, who needs to get over it? All you guys. They've got to get over this corporate. They've got to get the C level people. Like, my God, people, get real. Look, we all know what Shakespeare said about lawyers. Let's kill them all. They're the ones who are causing all this. Because <laughs> when something goes wrong, a lawsuit occurs. Slide. And they're waiting for litigation. All about litigation, and this is where it gets interesting. And I'm talking to some folks now about the issues of, of federal, states versus federal rights, mental capacities, uh, actors hiring, discrimination. All of these talked about. What very clean argument that they're all medical conditions. Every single one of them, whether it's from drug use, alcohol. Asperger's, ADD, every one of them is a among us. Yet we have discrimination against them. So we're kind of poking around and looking at seeing how this is going to, over the next couple of years, uh, have shake out. So we got to find a way. We, we, right now, we have people that are saying we can't do it. And I'm saying we have a way. We need to get, we need to be able to create the culture that will allow the geeks to thrive. And we've never needed it before. In one of the last 20 years, but historically, over several hundreds of years, this is an entirely different kind of mindset. Next slide. People say it's too hard. I was at a, uh, doing a thing, Air Force Base recently, and this lady, she was a major in the cyber division defend the United States Air Force. And I was talking about and having to do various things in order to be able to defend against them. And she goes, the hard. And my jaw kind of dropped that somebody from the US military say something like that. It's too hard. We we say you're about War. We took apart DNA. We, we've done some ridiculously, incredibly hard things in the last 50. Yet defending our networks is too hard because you're locked into this little tiny box. No. Cannot have, can, we have to get out of that box if we're going to be able to make this whole thing work. Next slide. Back. Everybody out there in the corporate and government world is saying, no, you can't do it. can't be done. You have to do it our way. And it's not our way. It's not. It has to be another way. It's my, I don't know. But I do know that the deputy is trying to do the same thing we've been doing for 30 years over and over again and expecting different results. That will not work. We have to try something new. Next slide. My remarks on uh, politically incorrect and some of the things that I think we need to do to set networks and getting some of the appropriate talent to, and I'll be questions you might have and discuss them and point of them. Questions? Come. Nobody? Nobody. Ah, they should ah we got uh, we got Athen over here. Hello. Uh, I was wondering if you're aware of the NSA program named, uh, I think, DI, uh, which is a profiling mechanism uh, that uh, pulls in various data sources and combines them to form a profile picture of US citizens. It was uh, originally developed to use against foreign uh, entities, but there was a big uh, scandal when it was used on American people. Are you aware of this, and what's your response? Thanks. 
<laughs> Let's go back to Adam Gettinger. Original that was called TIA, as I recall. Total information awareness. And that was what, 20 years ago? So they uh, began that effort and the ACLU privacy advocate said, no, you can't do that. The uh, it's probably doing what you're saying. They probably are. Uh, do I look? Can I stop it? No. Can you stop it? No. It's just that is part or not as part of the new world. Uh, I suggest you some stuff that began in the 1970s uh, called Echelon. We did the same damn thing on a global scale and domestic scale. And it was the United States, and Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. It was initially begun as a global surveillance program of Soviet and our enemy uh, capabilities, uh, posts and all that, and we started listening inward more. We've always spied on people to some extent or another. Now it's just more, uh, so they can, the NSA can grab, right now, my crap, grab my banking records, they can grab my travel records, they can do all of this stuff. Do I win? Yeah. However, I need to go back comment that does the name Gail Thacker mean anything to you guys at all? No, I'm seeing a lot of no's. Okay, good. Because <laughs> he's in prison? Good, never mind. Uh, Gail Thackeray was the leading prosecutor against 1991 called Operation Sun Devil. Any of you guys remember? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or none of you in computer security history either. <laughs> she was the, she was uh, one of the lead prosecutors in that thing with the Secret Service. One that concept, and I got to talking with her, and there was a lot of the similar kind of, and no offense, the question, NSA and all that. Yeah, they're doing it. I get it. And the question hell was you all so you can put. And that was a little paranoid question, fair enough. And she came off with an answer that makes a lot of sense. And we need to put it in context. She goes, we have something. You are, are below. We really care about. Just shut up and go away. <laughs> and the sheer data that is being collected today it is that, I mean, we're talking excellence of data on a daily basis that has to be correlated and glued together. What is NSA really for? Now, really serious bad guy. I make a whole lot of phone calls to Tehran. I'm going to be up on the list. Yeah. The problem is, and I agree with the gentleman, is in today's government, I'm not a big fan of big government. It's okay. However, see some of the problems that we've got in Western society about that we've become so scared and so paranoid, it reminds me of much of 1930 Germany. So, what the future has to be more worried. And I think activism is key to it, but we're not stop the NSA from listening. The NSA are the bad guys. Uh, I, 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 I trust the NSA a lot more than I do politicians. Does that answer the question? Yes. Uh, I was just looking for a comment and you provided a great one. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? I see one over there. Just come over here. Yeah, hi. Um, won't the problem of uh, uh, not harming people will uh, uh, dissolve in time because um, people who will be hired will, like selling your slides, uh, um, be one of the geeks and most likely with 300% uh, start your own uh, uh, company. 
and of course they're not gonna follow that policy of not hiring people that are uh, um, incompatible with uh, those policies. So there will probably become a company, uh, um, maybe Google is a good example, which have a, a, a lot of uh, different ways of, of doing business with their uh, slides uh, instead of stairs and, and like that. So, so um, and those companies will probably be, be hired by government uh, uh, to do that work for them. So eventually, it's probably a, a, a problem that will solve by time. Am I right, or do you have another vision about that? Um, I want to, let me ask you a question. Keep the microphone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we completely fail. Sorry? How much time do we have? Oh, um, well, probably less than the time it will take to develop those new companies. <laughs> it's your own question, haven't you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I have. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> You said it exa right, exactly the problem. Um, I wrote a book a number of years ago called Time-Based Security. And a lot of the way that I think about uh, security, the applying metric of time. So any comments and these things, as soon as you said that, it was like, okay. uh, are we gonna have a uh, pearlharbor.com cyber catastrophe? Maybe we already have to some extent. Um, I know that I can make the argument that a lot of the uh, issues that we've seen with the FAA in the US, the powers we've seen, I can make a really good argument that those were not just failures, that those were tests by our efforts. And how do I, why do I think that? Well, let's go back to the 1950s. And again, this is history. The United States versus the Soviet Union of the Cold War. Everybody remember Gary Powers? Does that name any, ever read a book? <laughs> no. All right. Gary Powers was a YouTube pod, and it was one of the first Mac 4 airplanes way back in the 1950s. And what we did with the U2s was allegedly the spy the Soviet and take photographs at 70,000 feet so we know where they're, what they're doing. What we also did was did it at the edge of Soviet radar installations with one airplane. Then there was a second facility designed to listen to the react of the Soviets who are pinging, if you will, of their radar systems. So we were pinging here and listening here. So when we look at some of the infrastructure problems that we've got these days, Understanding chaotic functions and trying to make a hard decision, an accident, or was it a test by an app? And then you add time on top of that. It's the dark answers, and you, I appreciate your question. I'm glad you let me throw it back at you because there's no easy answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it's just uh, uh, we have to choose like one solution, like it's are we going to have a catastrophe or are we going to change the uh, current companies to adjust their view on hiring the unhirable? Okay. Well, well, no, you've got the various functions going on, it's not just one function. Mm -hmm. So that are trying, and we're trying to, my goal is to get sets to change to allow better skill sets to come differently and operate differently inside of cultures that don't allow today and hopefully achieve that or the shit hits the fan. <laughs> okay. And I don't I don't know. I know that's but I just I don't know where that hard number is that anybody does. Yeah. Okay. Well thank you for answering well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for letting me answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but what does uh, shit hitting the fan look like? Right. <laughs> Another question. Yeah. <laughs> hey, me again. Uh, <laughs> what would uh, shit hitting the fan look like according to you? And don't you also somewhat agree at least that uh, it's already being splattered quite a bit around by the Chinese <laughs> in particular? Uh, ah. 
Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to get a dude with fucking pants. Come to the front. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the microphone. <laughs> Come, 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 come. They see nobody. Seriously. You will never get hired with those fans. Oh, her age nine. What huge spiders are? Event occurred. Morris? Nobody fucking studies his. <laughs> September 8, 1998. I have to be at Fort Bragg teaching uh, special forces on that day. On that day. That age, I have to war on the United States. And if you remember them. Could you please repeat the question? It was not a question. <laughs> September 8. China declared war on the United States of America. Not because of the taking out spy plane. No, 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 that was easy. That's <laughs> Thank you, only fans, no problem. What, what is a published a book called Unrestricted War? And it was modeled after the Zimmerman telegram from 1917 when the Germans did a similar thing. And what the Chinese said is a matter of doctrine. In a conventional war with the United States, you would win, U.S. In a nuclear exchange with China, the United States would win. Therefore, we're not going to play by your rules anymore. We hereby declare it to be asymmetric. And we declare the economy and critical infrastructures of the United States of America be legitimate targets of conflict. So that was 1998. This is 14 years later. Your comment of the Chinese owning this? Fucking A. <laughs> How much did they problem? That's why penetrations ever come to know who owns them. <laughs> and so the follow-up to that was, and I'm answering your questions backwards, when is the Going to hit the fan. That's critical. In my mind, that's critical. And it's what's, I'm doing a talk, actually, it's something I haven't talked about in 10 years. Confocal infrastructure failure. And what this means, and it's, if you took a picture of it in Utrecht when I was there with Andaloy, God, 12 years ago. Oh. <laughs> all right, you're, as you're down by the canals, you, you were taking everything up with all the streets and rebuilt. Everybody remember that? Your own history and your own. <laughs> and they had big cranes with big poles lifting up all the wires, and all the wires in electrical, telecommunications, all of them were in the same confocal ability. If I cut one, I cut them all. Newark or had a very similar thing. They were rebuilding it in 1990. It was a huge power outage because something was jackhammering through the main power conduit while they were doing construction. They tried to switch over a couple of auxiliary power feed, but they designed it in such a way that the backup power was in the same conduit. <laughs> so, my big fear is confocal critical infrastructure cascade failure. Does Karen scared you enough? Yes, uh, I'm scared enough. Like <laughs> <laughs> I ask you a question. What, what do you guys think about MEs? Do you think that they're real and what could happen and what's the defense? We fight better than them. Of which? What do we think of what? Chinese. MEs. Member of Parliament. MP? CME. Not EMP. CME. CME is nature's MP. It's called coronal mass, e mass ejection. Oh, and those is the alleged, according to NOAA and all the astronomers, he's seen those 
huge EMP events coming from the sun, depending upon which way we're turned or which way it comes at us. So what do we think about it? Do they exist? Uh, so it's secure. You made a dome. So it's secure. You use fiber optics. You use stuff. So it's it's at least uh, for the, from the sun point of view secure. So it can damage our in infrastructure. But yeah. How to build everything around it? It's we, we got, we've got all those couple of wires. We've got all those systems. We aren't prepared for any major damage. So yeah, it's it's a major problem. The sun, it is. I have an answer. Sure. Turn it off. Turn it off. You. Or don't. yes. Don't <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, It's fine with me. We go back to. Oh. If a CMB hits it. At the right angle, at the right time, we are then in the Stone Age. However, how many of you know how to turn off your system so that it's at no critical load on the circuitry? <laughs> pull the cord? Uh, I see two angles. Uh, pull the cord, pull the batteries. Yeah. That kind, or minimize that, that kind of event is to turn the low, don't have a complete circuit. So how many companies know how to shut themselves down, given that the CME would take between 18 and hours to reach from the sun? <coughs> Burning time to turn the planet on. This is something that is not being discussed openly. How did we shut down portions of the planet Especially the power. No, we should use military standards. The military has designed hardware like this to prevent their systems from being damaged like that. So we should use mil-spec stuff. <laughs> mil-spec design everything. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, quite, it's expensive, but it should work. And slow. <laughs> Transpact. The power is whether the ground or above ground are still low. Doesn't matter. You can have an EMP heart computer or an EMP heart site. You're going to protect. But you're not going to protect the critical infrastructures around the world. Unplug it. Turn the damn thing off. <laughs> You have the pants. It's true, he said. Turn the wall off, keep yourself alive. Any other comments or questions? I'm enjoying this. <laughs> <laughs> I might have one. Um, uh, as you probably know, um, the uh, communities are uh, getting more public nowadays. For example, 2600 meetings, hackerspaces, conference all around the world. Uh, how do you see these changing of, of being more of it in public so people can, can grow with each other instead of doing it all alone? Do you see it as a, uh, as a pre preparation for, for, for future security? <sighs> There's a lot of questions in there. <laughs> I, I think that the way that the community could be of the best help. You, don't, you guys have skills. You all have your skills. What does not exist is, and I don't want to use the wrong word here probably, would be almost a declaration of independence, uh, a, a manifesto of what is, is needed to make it all work. And I'm, I know I'm using the wrong words. Um, I, I did some stuff work back in the 1990s calling for a constitutional convention for cyberspace. What should it look like? We have never, to the best of my knowledge, had a sit down with whether it's 50 people or 500 people or whatever, or maybe 20 different groups do it, to have them put together, all right, we're sitting here bitching, we don't like it. What should it look like? What should it be? 
and I, they're coming up with a set of ideas, models, if you will. That's why I use the Declaration of Independence, because uh, that Thomas Jefferson, those guys were brilliant. To look at a really high, overarching, what do we really need? What do we want that makes sense from both the tech standpoint and the human standpoint? Who's all about the people, ultimately? This technology is bullshit unless we bring people into the equation. So I would love to see some sort of effort like that coordinated maybe between 20 or 30 different hackers around the world and pose them the same questions using facilitators to help organize and help structure to get a productive output. Uh, the nature of community is fairly anarchistic. Everybody kind of does their own thing and then things bubble up and then they bubble down and something happens here and something happens here and it's the lack of structure that brings value. But it's also the lack of structure that perhaps we need to, well, let's step back a bit and try to add some structure and define what, we, what makes sense and offer alternatives that are structured and make sense instead of just bitching. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Uh, slightly, slightly. Um, at least you're agreeing with me that uh, it's a good involvement that uh, hacker spaces and so are coming up and people are coming together. Uh, okay. And uh, what you're also saying is that um, a better structure for that uh, should promote uh, at least the outcome of those societies and communities more. Um, although I disagree slightly on, on, the, on the structure, uh, mainly because we also see that these hacker groups are uh, creating things because leak of structure. You know what I mean? I, I totally understand, I totally agree. However, the community tends to more focus on technology than people. And we forget about that 99.9% .9 of the people on the planet are idiots. <laughs> they live in the US. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, snap! <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't repeat it. <laughs> and, for example, we give them, and I'm picking up. We give the average user a desktop or a laptop computer that has 120 million lines of code? What? Why they want, want the iPad? Because all they got to do is push a couple buttons and they're done. We have given them too much and we've created so much complexity because we looked at it only from a technological standpoint, not from the human standpoint. And we need to really do a much better job as the community, whether that's Google, Microsoft, or the hacker spaces, and the influence that the community has, we need to simplify this shit. I agree, totally agree. Uh, and what you're also were saying in your presentation is, uh, because we have these structures about profiling people in the wrong place, so by skipping uh, people with ADHD, um, if you just leave this, leave this, this, Structures away, I think those people can get a, can have a better chance to to, uh, to be used in a use is maybe a little bit better work, but we can use them in a better way. You know, I I, I don't want to get hung up on use or the wrong words because I think we're all communicating. Uh, and again, I don't have all the answers, but to better uh, allow them to be productive, better allow them to contribute and be part of the solution, and not have them put to the by modern uh, society saying, we can't deal with you. We're gonna, we used to put people that were schizophrenics and hide them away in mental institutions. In the Victorian age, women that were going through menopause were put into sanatoriums and forgotten about forever. And hopefully we've come a lot further than that and we can recognize that in French, vive la différence, we are all different. Let's figure out how to make stuff work together. I agree on you. So do we have more questions? I think this is a nice quote to, uh, to finish also, uh, Wim. Well, 
thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. We, uh, for me, I really like your uh, like your talk uh, because it's uh, renewing people's view and uh, focusing on, on on different things. Um, I do have something for you uh, to shift. Uh, I'm not sure if the postal office is going to uh, to agree uh, on sent and shipping it, but uh, I will show it to you uh, slightly through the through the webcam. It's a uh, it's a beer from uh, from Utrecht where we are now. Beautiful. And um, I will take care that in somehow it will uh, it will reach you. Um, and I, will, I will send you an email about the details later. So well, I can see you guys in uh, Paris uh, in June and hanging in Paris. Uh, there's a big chance that you at least see some of us here. And, and uh, maybe next year. Uh, next summer on loan. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is Rob still doing that? Uh, no, no. Uh, Rob is still uh, involved as an uh, advisor, but as you probably know, that organizing conferences is taking a lot of energy, and uh, Rob also had the idea about renewing the team so new ideas can pop up, and that's also good. So, but with, thank you very much. Um, I think all you guys liked it uh, a lot of everyone. We're going to drink uh, another club mate. You know the drink? Uh, no, I, I, what, what is it? Show me. I'll send it also to you. Uh, we sell Why do you arrange it for you? Oh, okay. No, I do not know that drink. Uh, you know, uh, probably Nick Park. Oh, yeah. He usually uh, does every one or two years a round with a truck through the whole U.S. With uh, totally filled up with uh, Club Mata, uh, his price is slightly high, so I will send you one. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.